I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. What are we looking at today, Rob? We're going back to an old favorite. And, and I say old favorite because this legitimately is uh, something that both Lee and I love in it, Chinese literature. It's also quite old. <laughs> it is quite old. Yes, it's both favorite and old. Both are true. Uh, we're going back to the Zhuangzi. The Zhuangzi? Yes. Oh, man. This is one of the reasons I got into Chinese literature. It's Me one too. of the first things that I read of Chinese literature. And it's also one of the first things that most students of classical Chinese read in classical Chinese. Uh, if you're in, like, level two here at the University of Oregon, you read and translate some some Zhuangzi. Really? Yes. That seems crazy because he's well, so hard to read and he's constantly he's playing so hard, my game. My he's game. so hard to maybe parse, but the, the actual Chinese, you know, it, it's, it's old enough that it's adhering to some of the basic rules. Hmm. And it's a little easier to follow than some later things. Like Tang poetry is way harder to translate yeah, sure. in some ways. But Lee and I both love Zhuangzi. I, I, I think most people who like Chinese literature like Zhuangzi. Most people who study Chinese literature outside of China like Zhuangzi. I've been in China and Taiwan, and I'll tell people I like Zhuangzi, and they look at me funny, and they get kind of concerned. I had a friend tell me that I should at this age be reading Confucius, <laughs> but I should wait until I get old and am wise enough to not completely screw up Zhuangzi. That's interesting. And then when I'm in retired, read Zhuangzi. I heard a similar comment from a student of mine in China, but about Johnny Cash. So I think maybe Johnny Cash is similar to Zhuangzi. Is, in a lot is of Zhuangzi, are you saying Zhuangzi is the Johnny Cash of ancient I, I Chinese think, I think philosophy that, I think literature? I, may go with, I think I may go with that. My, my student's actual comment was when I played him some Johnny, it was a culture class, I taught it years ago, and I played a bunch of Johnny Cash songs and we looked at some videos and one of my students said, I think we need to be older in order to really understand this. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that's a pretty solid comment. So maybe I am saying that Zhuangzi is the Johnny Cash of Chinese literature <laughs> or philosophy. Let's, uh, Let's turn from in. there into the passage. So what we're actually talking about is one of many anecdotes involving Zhuangzi and his friend Huizi. And all of these are fantastic because mm. Huizi is Zhuangzi's sort of... He's the dumb guy. He's the dumb guy. Very good. He's the dumb guy. If this was a, a comedy duo, the, Huizi would be the straight man who always sets up Zhuangzi for the punchline and, 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 you know, things like that. He's the guy that says something obviously dumb that Zhuangzi can work with. Hmm. And, and they're all like, all the stories are like this. Huizi always ends up doing something, and you can almost see Zhuangzi rolling his eyes and explaining why this was so dumb. So I'm actually just going to read the passage. It's a short one. That's very famous. Zhuangzi and Huizi were crossing the Hao River by the dam. Zhuangzi said, See how free the fish leap and dart. That is their happiness. Huizi replied, Since you are not a fish, how do you know what makes fish happy? Zhuangzi said, Since you are not me, how can you possibly know that I do not know what makes fish happy? Huizi argued, If I, not being you, cannot know what you know, it follows that you, not being a fish, cannot know what they know. The argument is complete. Zhuangzi said, Wait a minute. Let us get back to the original question. What you asked me was, how do you know what makes fish happy? From the terms of your question, you evidently know I know what makes fish happy. I know the joy of fish in the river through my own joy as I go walking along the same river. I should clarify this first just in case there are people out there who have access to the story in the original Chinese. This is kind of an expansion of the classical. There's one or two phrases that were thrown in there kind of as an explanatory measure. And this translation is by who? This is based on a translation by Thomas Merton, who is a Trappist monk in the U.S. and a huge fan of uh, classical Chinese philosophy. And the podcast. I and believe. the podcast as well. He <laughs> died in the 60s, but I think he still knew about he listens. Us. He listens as a ghost. He listens as a ghost. This is clearly a weird, circuitous passage. It's incredibly right? weird, and it's really hard to understand yeah. exactly what's going on, but I think that's part of the, if I could say, the joy of it. It is. It is the joy. And, and this, for me, is why I, I consider Zhuangzi in really a literary fashion more than a philosophical one, because there's, there are levels here. Zhuangzi is so playful hmm. in ways that I don't think any Western philosopher ever has been. And really, no Chinese 
philosopher is ever as playful with language as Zhuangzi is. One of the interesting things, so one of the reasons why this could be thought of as philosophy is because in Taoism, this concern about whether language really means anything mm. is very prominent. Whereas Confucius, you have this concept of Zhengming, which is essentially just writing, making the names right, yeah. getting the names right. So mm -hmm. aligning names with the things. Yes. Chuanzi doesn't get that. He he completely rejects that. He's he's in a whole different. He's he's right. not even playing the same game that Confucius is playing. Here, I think that's part of what's going on. Yeah, and a lot of what makes Chuanzi fun is and for Chuanzi and Lao Tzu both the sort of foundational Taoists is some of the little word games they tinker with and play with. Hmm. So the opening line of the Dao Te Jing, the, the Tao, the, the the book of the way, Dao Ke Dao, Dao Fei Chang Dao. Dao. Now. The, the scholar Zhang Long, she pointed out once, though, that because the opening three characters are Dao, Ke, Dao, and it's usually translated something like the way which can, or the, the, the way which can be named is not the true way. The way but it's the same character. Yeah. So actually, it's the way that can be weighed. weighed. And so it actually starts <laughs> w -A -Y -E -D, out. W-A-Y-E-D, yeah. not. But it starts out as a pun. Exactly. Which is wonderful. That the, the foundational work of Dao, Taoism or the, the way is a pun. Yeah. Right? It's great. And Drongs is in that, in that vein. So you have these two guys standing on a dam, standing on a river by a dam, looking into the water at the fish, right? And Drongs says, ah, look how happy the fish are. You know why they're happy? Because they're jumping and leaping. And his buddy, Quaid's the dumb one, goes, how in the world do you know what makes fish happy? Hmm. Now, there, from there, you could really go into a sort of a metaphysical explanation of this and that. And the response, what's Drongs' response? <laughs> Drongs' response is, you're not me. How do you know? I don't know what makes fish happy. Fantastic, right? And so one of the things that I wanted to point out with this is, yes, it can be explored as philosophy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can just be funny. Uh, one of our professors, Luke Haberstadt, has pointed out one of the great things about early Chinese literature is the fact that these genres which we have which define things, big scare quotes, Chinese literature or Chinese history, those don't really apply here. And I think, right. I mean, those don't really apply in this period. So things that are historical, have lots of literary elements. I think that's one of the cool things about yes. Zhuangzi is you can read them however you want and he's going to you know, melt your mind either way. If you're reading him as a historical text, right. you can read him as philosophy, as literature, just as a giant joke, really. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's it's fun in a way that what scans as philosophy in the Western tradition simply can't be or rarely is. Maybe it is occasionally. But in this one, for example, there's almost a part A and a part B. Part A is the almost like vaudeville slapstick back and forth. Look at the fish. They're jumping. That's what makes them happy. How do you know it makes them happy? How do you know I don't? You know, that kind of thing. Can you think of another philosopher who is funny? Like Chinese philosopher? Any philosopher. Any philosopher. I don't know. Kind of, well, I guess, you know, it kind of depends on what we call philosopher. How about you? No. I don't, and Zhuangzi is the only philosopher who I think is funny. The only one who comes close to me is Wittgenstein. Really? Well, he's not, he's not really funny in this way. But he says things that sound like he's messing with people. But I think you've got a point. that there, Philosophy is usually the purview of boring. seriousness. and bo Well, maybe sometimes boring. Too. Serious. Yeah. Yeah, serious is probably a nicer yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> like, sure, than boring. For all the philosophers who are now like, yeah, I'm no we, longer we just lost. We just lost the 10 philosophers who regularly yeah, exactly. listen. They're all like, eh, we're done. <laughs> you, you, you made the point earlier that in this period of Chinese arts and letters, the, the line between genres, between philosophy, literature, history, doesn't really exist. So mm -hmm. if you were to ask someone in, the, in that time, is this literature philosophy, they might conceivably say yes, because what, what, that doesn't mean anything. It's just writing, right? Mm -hmm. can, can I turn a little bit to the sort of metaphysical aspects of this passage? I'm, I'm curious, Rob, what you think. Do you actually believe that we have the capability as humans of knowing anything like do do you think that you can ever know whether or not i'm happy wow lee 
I'm glad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm glad you're asking questions that we can effectively get to in a, a 25 minute <laughs> podcast. Tell me, Rob, what's the secret to all of life and existence? So I'm in, glad you asked that, Lee. In in one sentence. In one <laughs> sentence. In in one sort of Zhuangzi like sentence. And actually, you know, I'm going to do have to give you a Zhuangzi like <laughs> answer, which is Zhuangzi would field the question by sort of playing with the words you just used. Mm. Right? So here, for example, Zhuangzi's response to Huizi, when Huizi says, aha, aha, I've got you, right? If I can't know what you know because I'm not you, then it follows that you can't know, you know, what the fish know. Hmm. And Zhuangzi says, stop. The thing at issue here isn't the essence, isn't the sort of philosophical truth. It's the words you just used. Hmm. What you asked me was literally, how do I know? Not if I know, but how. That's what you said. I, I actually, so a lot of Zhuangzi is about words and wordplay and whether words mean anything. I don't actually read this passage as a kind of wordplay passage. Mm-hmm. I read it as, I read Zhuangzi's response as a metaphysical response. Go for it. Huizi is suggesting that the metaphysical differences between Zhuangzi and the fish are so great that there is an epistemological a crisis that there's no way that Zhuangzi being different can know what the fish feels like. And I think Zhuangzi is actually trying to undercut that and point out that there are all these differences and there are at the same time similarities. That's part of what he's saying is I know it by the Hao River. The Hao River is the river that they're on. And what he's saying is you are you Huizi are creating this category of fish and Zhuangzi. And because those are two separate categories, you know, I can't understand the fish, but he's redefining the category. So he's changing the epistemology. He's saying that the thing that matters is I'm happy beside the Hao River, and he is happy. The fish is happy beside the Hao River. And in the Hao River. The in the fish Hao hopefully River. is not beside the Hao River. Whatever. <laughs> it, it's not actually that clear in, right. in Chinese. But, I mean, we all know that fish in China are very different from fish in... They, they can walk on land. Everyone but, knows But this. he's making an, a categorical epistemological argument, at least that's the way I'm reading it, that the river, that him being by the river and the fish being in the river make them somehow similar and he is questioning whether Huizi has the categories wrong or like he's drawing these artificial lines between human and fish that really shouldn't be drawn. And and why why does it matter? Like can't can't we can we really say that joy is simply joy. It's it's experienced by all sure. things and that allows us to relate to a fish or a tree mm-hmm. or whatever that because we're experiencing the same elements and experiencing some sensation of pleasure or joy, surely that means we're connected. I might not know exactly what the fish is thinking, but I'm appreciating this water, so is the fish. And so in that sense, we're connected. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's, that's a solid point because this, is, this does scan as philosophy. This is someone explaining the nature of things. But mm-hmm. one of the, the provocative things in this for me, though, is Zhuangzi also does not seem to be making a firm division between things as they are and words like he's there's not like you're you're using a word to describe something that exists over here the words and the things are kind of intertwined so when when Zhuangzi is questioning Huizi it's not just a word game right he's not just tweaking Huizi's words and making fun of him he's suggesting he's doing that he he is doing that yes he is doing that but the other thing he's doing is saying why are you assuming that our little word game here uh, has nothing to do with the way things are? Like in quotes, hmm. it's they're 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 linked, they're interlinked. You know, hmm. so us playing with these words kind of suggests the silliness of firm categories. The fact hmm. that you know we can do this stupid word game means that a lot of these divisions really aren't that meaningful. So, Rob, did I convince you? It's possible. Although maybe I already had that idea and you just brought it out. I don't know. I feel like we're in a sort of a – okay, which of us would be Huizi on this podcast? Which of us would be the dumb one? No I think, one's going to I think we'd that. both be the dumb one. I think we'd both be Huizi. I think I'm, a, I'm comfortable with that. So, Rob, can I ask you, do you think the listener will find joy in this podcast? How do you know 
that the listener <laughs> will not find joy in this podcast if you're not the listener, Lee. I know by the Howe River. We're not by the Howe River. We're by the Willamette well, River. Well, we're kind of close. I mean, in, we're by a river. in universal terms. Okay. See, this is the problem, though, because if a listener's not by the river, then we don't really have, have anything to go with, go on here. We should, I mean, we should invite all our listeners to jump in a river yes, after listening to this. Because we're going to do that in the Willamette, and then we'll be, we'll be joined somehow metaphysically. Well, I mean, the river connects to the ocean, which connects True. to the... That's very true. That's uh, another good passage for us to look yes. at in a later podcast, the yeah. autumnal floods. That's yes. a great passage. A and I want to, you know, one of my parting thoughts here, I suppose, is yeah, this is a literature podcast, but I cannot stress enough just how literary and just how enjoyably written the Zhuangzi is. And how disturbingly hard to understand yes but to wrap of, your to wrap your yeah. hands around but this is one of the reasons i find it so compelling is that it's written in a way that's so accessible yeah. and yet it's really not that accessible when you start to dig i really wish i could write like chuang Tzu. Oh, absolutely both accessible and totally incomprehensible yes i do too i wish you could write that way as well <laughs> All right, I think that that's where we should call it. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.